And so far, I'm glad to say that nobody that I am fond of or know very well has, uh, some people have had it, but nobody has died. So yeah. that is, I hope Scotland? you can say that. Yeah. Uh, in Scotland, where? They must, it must be in Edinburgh and the bigger cities or where? A, a bit, yes. Um, it, it's mainly in the big urban centres. So where we are is, uh, I mean, it can probably spread given time, of course, but uh, but at the moment, at any rate, we're sort of roughly speaking okay. Mm. <laughs> a a Look, cousin what's... of mine had it. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I, 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 no, I said I'm sorry. I said a cousin of mine uh, had uh, COVID, and uh, oh. he he is at, not here, but in Oxford. Uh, oh, he is yes. at Saint Catherine's University. And oh, yeah. uh, he was quite ill with it and uh, went on a ventilator for a few days and now come off it and now back home. So, oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. No, I'm so glad. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you were my saying... My friends had to go in hospital for a couple of weeks, but again, he was all right. So, right. I, I was just saying that one of my oldest friends in London uh, had yeah. to go into hospital, but... Um, after a couple of weeks, he was all right to discharge. So there we are. Right. I hope. right. Do you see right. patients now? As a, do you work as a psychiatrist or no longer? No, I, I, I um, well, I'm past retirement age in any case. But um, I would have carried on for much longer if it hadn't been for the surprising success of the master and his emissary. I didn't really expect it to take off. I thought a few people would find it very interesting, you know, and then it would be forgotten. But now it's sold over 100,000 copies, which is a lot. Wow. And uh, wow. for a technical book, it's not an easy read. So um, yeah. as a result, people kept saying, can you write for us? Can you speak to us? And I just couldn't actually do that and carry on with my clinical load. So I decided to stop. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that's amusing is the, the photograph you've got on Fine Online um, was taken some years ago, as you can see. But yes. also it accentuates the fact that um, when the lockdown started here, it was time for me to have a haircut. And <laughs> uh, able to get a haircut. I, I even looked up online YouTube how to cut your own hair, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the, the echo, I just wish I'd had the force to have my a little haircut, yeah, the, the few hairs that I have left, yeah. Well, we've got to half past. Do you know whether we should start let's, or what let's should start. we do? Let's start. It's 5, 5 p.m. So, uh, okay. Nath, uh, uh, Apurva, you sure. want to introduce him? Shall I introduce him, uh, Sudhir? Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So, really a, a great... Uh, can you hear me? I don't know. Okay, really a great privilege for me hearing. Uh, to be uh, chairing what I'm sure will prove to be a fascinating uh, session um, uh, in the lecture series organized by Fine and Dr. Sudhir Kothari. Uh, gives me great pleasure in introducing uh, the renowned uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, uh, consultus, consultant emeritus at the Bethlehem and Maudsley Hospital. Uh, London, Fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And what I found most interesting was that be before becoming a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. McGilchrist had a life in the humanities, uh, taught uh, indeed English literature at Oxford University, and in addition was elected uh, three times as a fellow to All Souls College in Oxford. Uh, in 2009, he uh, published a, a masterful scholarly book on the relationship between the cerebral hemispheres called The Master and the Emissary. And I've just, subsequent, I've just learned that it has sold 100,000 copies. Uh, it's distinguished for its scholarship and provides an insight into what it means to be human. All of us are delighted to welcome him and look forward to hearing his talk titled, Do We or Do We Not Have Two Brains? Thank you. You are welcome, uh, Ian. 
Thank Go you ahead. very much. Thank you for your kind words. Um, very much appreciated. And this is a fascinating thing that I never anticipated that I would be able to do to reach so many people in India like this. So thank you very much for asking me along. Um, and as you heard, I had a rather different life before training in medicine. I trained in medicine in my late 20s, about 10 years later than most people in this country. And prior to that, I had been very interested in literature, philosophy and theology. And uh, I came to medicine through an interest in the mind-body problem. Um, I went to all the philosophy seminars and they seemed to me too disembodied, actually. So I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to approach this question through a more embodied way of being, and that was to train as a doctor and work in the overlapping area between neurology and psychiatry. And that I did for about 20 years uh, at the Maudsley in London. So uh, today I'm, I'm going to now share my screen with you. So um, yes, uh, so let's see if this works. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Kothari um, suggested the rather racy title, Do We or Do We Not Have Two Brains? And I thought it was rather fun. So uh, that's what we're, we're going to be, be hearing about. Um, but this is a topic that goes back a long way. Um, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, and Goethe and Pascal all commented on this twofold nature of man. And Pascal says, uh, it, it's so evident that some have thought we had two souls. Um, now, uh, let me just see if I can make this go on. Ah, there. I, I, I know you are all very familiar with the basis of this, but I just want to say that when I started researching uh, hemisphere differences 20 years ago, I was told that it was career death, that I must not touch this topic with a barge pole because it's the sort of thing that's pop psychology and nobody believes it anymore. And uh, I, I was at the Maudsley and I had a distinguished mentor, uh, Alwyn Lishman, the, the author of the great uh, classic textbook, Organic Psychiatry, and he also said, you know, uh, let you, you have a promising career, don't do this. <laughs> However, I was very interested in what I knew. And it started from two or three observations that I think ought to intrigue anyone. And they were never fully explored in medical school. Of course, we know the brain has this structure. But why? Why is the brain divided? since its whole purpose is to make connections and its power is in the number of connections it can make. Why waste the opportunity to make more connections by having a whopping great divide down the middle? Now this rather lugubrious looking gentleman, he's not very happy about having the top of his skull lifted off, but this is a, a good illustration um, for a lay audience of um, what we mean by the, the corpus callosum which is a band which only connects directly 2% of neurons. Only 2% of neurons cross the corpus callosum. And each hemisphere is massively intraconnected in a way that it is much less interconnected. And of course, it's intraconnected by the, the great um, superhighways of the superior longitudinal fasciculus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the uncinate fasciculus. The second question that one might want to ask after asking why is it divided is why is it asymmetrical? For what possible reason should it be asymmetrical since the skull, the box which contains it, is symmetrical? And of course in medical school I learned about the expansion of the left hemisphere and here in this illustration, which is compiled from a series of MRI scans, um, you see the expansion, the posterior expansion of the left hemisphere on the right in the screen. And that was said to be to do with language. 
But actually, it is not to do with language. We know this because from the endocasts of skulls of prehistoric man, before we believe they were capable of language, these areas are enlarged. And they're also enlarged in gorillas, in bonobos, chimpanzees, and other of the primates who don't have language and can't be taught language. Uh, the, the most successful is about 300 words, whereas you probably have 70,000 words. So there's something mysterious about that. And what's even more strange is that nobody in medical school mentioned to me the frontal asymmetry. There you can see it at uh, the top of the screen with the right hemisphere being, of course, on the left. The expansion of the frontal lobe uh, on the right is the most asymmetrical region in the entire brain. It wasn't even mentioned to me in medical school. Um, and this is probably the latest evolved part of the brain. Uh, and this expansion here is also present in the great apes. And of course, it's called Yakov Lev in talk after Yakov Lev, who first described it as looking as though the brain had been given a twist um, so that you get this strange asymmetrical structure. And the third question, not just why is it divided and why is it asymmetrical, is why is the corpus callosum getting smaller in proportion to the size of the brain? So on the left here, you see a slice through the corpus callosum, a sagittal section of a dog's brain. And on the right, you see a sagittal section through the human brain. And the size of the corpus callosum has clearly not kept pace with the size of the brain. Now, I do actually have a talk online, which I gave to the Evolutionary Psychology Special Interest Group of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London a couple of years ago. So if you're interested in learning more about that from a technical point of view, uh, there is an hour's talk available on YouTube. If you put in my name and the letters EPSIG, EPSIG, Evolutionary Psychology Special Interest Group, uh, that, then that will bring that up. But in any case, here is the corpus callosum not keeping up with the size of the brain. And what's more, as I learned in medical school, but just put it to one side as a curiosity, much of the traffic across the corpus callosum is to do with inhibition. It's actually functionally inhibitory to a very large extent. Quite a lot of the fibers are glutamatergic and therefore excitatory, but a very high proportion of those terminate on inhibitory into neurons that are GABAergic. And so a lot of the traffic between the hemispheres is telling the other hemisphere, keep out of this, I'm dealing with it. So these three things on their own suggested to me that it wasn't good enough to say, well, it's a non-topic, there isn't any difference. Because also as a clinician, and you are all clinicians, we know perfectly well from experience that when somebody has a stroke or a tumor in a certain place in one hemisphere, it has predictably quite different consequences from if it had um, taken root in the mirror image place in the homologous uh, region of the contralateral hemisphere. So it really doesn't stand up at all to say there's nothing here. And I devoted 20 years to finding out what there might be here. And I'm going to, in a very, very uh, superficial and brief way, deliver uh, some of the um, uh, findings on that. And if you want to know more about why I say that, um, then there is the book that I've written and the one that I have just finished, which isn't published yet and probably won't be published for another year, called The Matter with Things. Now, on the internet, you find things like this. It was titled Right and Left. I've changed the title, as you see, to Right and Wrong. This is the sort of thing that goes around the internet. And this is actually one of the better ones from um, uh, the site of a, of a clinical psychologist on uh, the internet. And it, every single one of these things uh, that said here about the right brain and the left brain is wrong except for one. There is one thing in that whole list that is correct. All the others are completely wrong. So I usually start talking by saying to people, 
put out of your mind everything you know about brain differences. It's not true that the right hemisphere um, is emotional and the left isn't. The left is perfectly emotional. In fact, the most lateralized of all emotions is anger. And guess what? It lateralizes to the left hemisphere. Both hemispheres take part in language and in logic. And both hemispheres are capable of visuospatial functioning and of emotion. So where does that leave us? Does that not mean that my colleagues were right when they said to me, no, 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 really there's no difference? Well, no, I don't think it does. And the reason that the mistake is made because we saw the brain as a machine. And if you ask a machine or about a machine uh, to find out what it is like, you ask, what does it do? And we found that each half of the hemis each hemisphere, each half of the brain does, in inverted commas, everything the same. It's just that they do them in a reliably different way. So it's about the how, not the what. So each takes part in our experience of everything, but with a different take on it, if you like, a different manner, a different attitude, a different disposition towards it. Well, those 20 years of research um, issued in 2009, uh, this book, which was um, a new revised edition was released this year to mark the 10th anniversary of the release of the paperback. Um, and uh, in it, I explore the origins of asymmetry uh, and the human, the human meaning of it. So the first part of the book is neuropsychology and philosophy. The second half is applying it to the history of human culture. And I'll say just a little about that um, uh, towards the end of this talk. Now, uh, is it just that our brains are asymmetrical? Absolutely not. Every brain we have looked at, not just primates, not just mammals, not just reptiles or amphibians, not just insects, even nematode worms, their neural nets are asymmetrical. And the oldest creature that we know, the reason I put this up is it's a fossil of a trilobite. And we know that trilobites behavior was lateralized because bites out of trilobites are usually um, or disproportionately commonly on one side and not on the other. Now this, uh, this is um, uh, a brain scan like one you've never seen before, uh, because of course it's not a brain scan at all. What it is, is it's a scan of the most ancient living creature we know called Nematostella vectensis, a sea anemone, 700 million years old. And as you can see from this picture, it is asymmetrical about the long axis. Um, these are um, aspects of the neural network and the long axis of the creature is from left to right in the picture. And you can see that only in one half of the picture are there a certain kind of neurons. Now, what is all this about? It certainly can't be denied. Tim Crow, who's, I don't know whether neurologists know of him, but he works in the overlapping area between neurology and psychiatry and is one of the most distinguished um, psychiatrists we have in Britain, wrote, except in the light of lateralization, nothing in human psychology or psychiatry makes any sense. And the second is a quote from Ono Gunturkun, a, a Turkish neuroscientist who works at the University of Bochum in Germany and received Germany's most distinguished science prize, the Leibniz Prize, for his work on asymmetry in animal brains. He wouldn't have received a prize for that if there was nothing in asymmetry. And he says, hemispheric asymmetries pervade practically all major neural systems of the human brain. There's hardly any perceptual, cognitive, or motor system that is not affected by left-right differences of at least some of its components. Now, with that um, said, I don't think it's good enough to dismiss this topic. The question is really what does it tell us and why do we have it? 
Well, it has to do with attention. And attention sounds like, you know, another cognitive function, um, but it's much more than just another cognitive function. It is the way in which we understand the world. If you pay attention in one way to the world, you find there different things from if you pay a different kind of attention. And what we know, and this is not controversial, and you will know this from your experience, is that when patients have a right hemisphere stroke, there are alterations in their attention. Commonly, they show neglect of the left side of space, but moreover, they get a sort of tunnel vision. They get um, a hyper-focused, narrow, pathologically narrow window of attention. Uh, and this doesn't happen uh, when you have damage to the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is the active partner because the right hemisphere has a quite different kind of attention, which is broad, sustained, open and vigilant. And my hypothesis, and I don't know one that explains the matter better than this, is that creatures evolved to survive in conditions where they needed to catch prey, gather food, pick up twigs to build nests, whatever it was, they needed to focus narrowly on an aspect of the world which they wished to manipulate. And for that, they needed very precisely focused, narrowly target, targeted attention to detail. But if that was the only kind of attention they were paying, they would become somebody else's lunch while they were getting their own lunch because they needed to be paying a completely different kind of attention at exactly the same time. And that was this broad, open, sustained, vigilant attention. So you have hereditary genetics evolution has left us with this divide, which operates in all known living creatures. Now, if you do pay attention to the world in two different ways, as long as the two hemispheres are working together, we're not aware of it because it takes place, the synthesis takes place in a meta control center in the tectum of the midbrain, the decisions about which way attention is going to be disposed is controlled from a meta center in the tectum of the midbrain. Um, and so, which is alternating the way in which we see the world at millisecond um, resolution in time. And so, of course, we're not aware of it, which is just as well, because if we were aware of it, we would hardly be able to lead our lives. But nonetheless, we can see when patients have lesions and when we do laboratory experimental studies in which we deal with one hemisphere at a time, that this yields two different pictures of the world. And I'm going to go through the 10 or 12 main differences in a very simplistic way, a very quick and dirty way, but because there's limited time, that's what I have to do. In each of the dipoles I'm going to put up on the screen, the one on the left is the one that the left hemisphere is mainly interested in latching onto. And the one on the right is the one that the right hemisphere enables us to take in. The first is a difference between what is known already, what is familiar, what fits into our mental categories nicely. And the left hemisphere prefers things where it can pigeonhole them and say, I understand that it's one of those, I know those from experience. The right hemisphere, however, is the one that is on the lookout for something new. V.S. Ramachandran, you know, the very famous neuroscientist now working in um, Los Angeles, um, he calls the right hemisphere the devil's advocate because it's the one that's saying maybe it's not what you, the left hemisphere, think it is. Don't jump to conclusions. And there's another thing that is um, not true. It's often said that the right hemisphere sort of jumps to conclusions that the left hemisphere is careful and thoughtful. This is not the case. It's, exactly the opposite. The right hemisphere is much more careful, much more willing to see shades of difference. The left hemisphere, because it serves the predator in us, it hasn't got time to go, hmm, I don't know, is that a seed or is that a piece of grit? Is that a rabbit or is it, I don't know. It's gotta be decisive. 
Um, sorry, the next one is that, and this follows from it, that the left hemisphere likes to be certain. And you could say that the left hemisphere is closing down all the time to a certainty, whereas the right hemisphere is opening up to possibility. And these are two strands in our thinking, in philosophy indeed, the desire to narrow down and get fixed and the desire to open up and see the broader, more complex, more nuanced picture, which can't be cut and dried, can't be made black and white. So the left hemisphere likes either or black and white, whereas the right hemisphere sees shades of difference. So the left hemisphere says, what's this? Is it a duck or is it a rabbit? What do you mean? Tell me. And the right hemisphere is saying, well, it's a duck rabbit, you know, it can be a duck, it can be a rabbit, it's both. Going with this, the left hemisphere sees things fixed, because if you see the world in narrow, uh, fixed certain fragments, the bits that you're latching onto, the bits you need in order to grab and take, don't forget it's the left hemisphere that controls the right hand with which we say we grasp things. If it is going to do that, it doesn't want a fluid picture, it wants something like a still snapshot that they can grasp. And so it tends to see flow as made up rather like an old cine film of a series of static frames. Whereas the right hemisphere sees flow as a seamless extension. That again might not sound so very important, but philosophically speaking, it has enormous consequences for whether you see the world as built up mechanically from static pieces or whether you see the world as living, flowing, um, interconnected holes. So, you know, uh, in palinopsia and achinotopsia, which are similar conditions, uh, patients see visual trails uh, like a juddering cine film. And um, there's a lot of research on this, which shows that it is very, very much more common after right posterior lesions than after left. All of this also goes with the left hemisphere seeing the parts of things and the right hemisphere tending to see the whole. So this is true of say the body image, which as you know, is not just a visual image, but a uh, kinesthetic image in many modalities, which is in the right temporary parietal region. And the right hemisphere has this image of the body as a whole, whereas the left hemisphere can identify a leg an arm, a hand, a finger, a nose, a mouth. But it's much less good at seeing the whole. And this has many uh, consequences, uh, again, as you can imagine, for the way in which we interact with the world, the way we think about um, the world. Um, and in reality, what we do is we see the whole. We see what in German is called the Gestalt, which is the overall image or shape or form before we see the parts. Now, um, those of you who have not seen this before may not immediately see that this is actually a Dalmatian dog. I can see, I'm hoping this pointer will, can you see my pointer? That is the dog's mouth. There is an ear, that's his head. And there's its back and a tail going off up there, hind leg, foreleg. So you've got a Dalmatian dog, a spot, spotted dog, sniffing the ground in the shade of a tree where two paths cross. Now, there is no way you can build that up by going, ah, that's a bit of a dog, and that's a bit of a path. It's impossible. You see the whole, and there's what's called an aha moment, which is robustly associated with activity in the right superior temporal sulcus and in the right amygdala. And it's the basis of insight, um, mathematical insight, scientific insight, artistic insight, that moment in which the thing comes into shape is uh, a very much strongly right hemisphere um, uh, uh, subserved function. Uh, these are examples of what happens to people who have right, uh, mainly right posterior, at any rate, parietal occipital lesions. On the left, you see a man reduced to a schema of a blob with three sticks. In the middle, you see a bicycle, which is interesting because it has pedals and it has two wheels, but the pedals are bigger than the wheels and the relationship between them is the wrong way up, 
Um, so again, there's focus on parts, but not on the relationships of the whole. And on the right, you see a house. It's got one of those things on top, which tells us that it's a house, but otherwise you'd be um, hard pushed to know that. Um, so once again, the left hemisphere likes things to be clear and explicit. It breaks things down analytically and it says, I see it's made up of these things. But the almost all of what we experience is not explicit. Even the language, which is the most explicit thing that we do, is not by any means mainly explicit. A computer would not understand it, even though it had um, a, a, a grammar book and a lexicon to look up, because much of what we say is uh, in the way in which it's said, in the things that we imply but don't actually specify, and in the things that we leave unsaid, all that the right hemisphere picks up. And that's in, in linguistics, that's called pragmatics. It's how you understand an utterance in context. So, um, the, you know, for example, if it's, if it's uh, very hot and I say, gosh, it's, it's hot in this room, um, you know that what I mean is, can we open the door? Um, whereas your left hemisphere is going, well, Yes, I know that. Why are you why are you mentioning the weather? I can I can see that for myself. It doesn't understand the implicit. The left hemisphere tends to take things out of their context, and of course they change completely when they're out of their context. They become abstracted, and they become put into. It's much easier to put abstract things into categories than real things because real things carry their context with them. When you try to grab hold of them, you have to bring the context with them. Um, for example, if you really want to understand a heart, the best way is not to cut it out of a body and put it in um, a dish on the table and say, right, now let's look at this heart and find out what it is. Um, because it's now being taken out of its context in which alone you'd be able to see what it was. And things change completely with context this is obvious about poetry and about jokes, that once they're made explicit and taken out of the context, they become unfunny, unmoving, and they rely on being dependent on a lot of implicit material that is in the context. And context can completely change the meaning of a word. For example, in America, there are four sizes of cereal packets. There's uh, jumbo, which means very large, then there's economy, which means large. Then there's family, which means medium. And finally, there's large, which means small. So the left hemisphere is busy generalizing things and it puts things into fairly gross categories. Whereas with finer categorization, and certainly when it comes to the unique example, it's the right hemisphere that is more helpful to us it alone understands unique cases. And here I would refer to um, two cases, both from Switzerland, uh, one of a farmer who had a um, right temporoparietal lesion. And before having the stroke, he could tell each of his uh, cattle by looking at them and knew their names. But afterwards, he found it difficult to tell a cow from a horse. And another case is of um, a woman who was an ornithologist. She'd studied all the birds of Switzerland. And after her right hemisphere stroke, she said rather sadly, all the birds look the same. So um, this is from a paper by Velotigara's group. Um, so as it were, the right hemisphere is seeing the individual, whereas the left hemisphere is seeing the category, the gross category, the very rough category into which things Four, and those categories are of use, whereas there's a relationship that goes beyond utility towards Sarah and Mark. Uh, again, this is in keeping with the fact that the left hemisphere is more at home with the inanimate. Um, inanimate things tend to be coded in the left hemisphere. Animate things more in the right hemisphere, though they are also coded in the left hemisphere to some extent. Although one study I know shows a clean split with the left hemisphere um, dealing with the inanimate and the right hemisphere with the animate. Um, and 
that's uh, uh, intriguing in itself. What I very much like is that musical instruments are treated in the brain like living things and are exceptions to what we call inanimate objects and are classified with the animate. Then there is a general emotional timbre of each hemisphere. The right hemisphere tends to be realistic. It tends to accept the reality. It's much more in touch with reality than the left hemisphere. And you will know this from uh, right hemisphere damaged patients tend to be in denial. They, they may have half their body um, paralyzed and yet they'll make light of it or dismiss it or say, oh, it's nothing or it doesn't matter or there's nothing wrong with it. Um, they'll say, I can move it perfectly well. And when asked to move it, they can't. And then they think they have moved it. So this is very extreme denial. If you force it on their attention and hold the arm in front of them and then say, now move that, they'll say, that's not my hand, that's yours, doctor, or it belongs to the patient in the next bed or something of this kind. It's very hard for the left hemisphere to get realistic. It is unreasonably optimistic about everything. Um, and patient, this is one of, the why, one of the reasons why it's harder to rehabilitate patients after a right hemisphere stroke than after a left hemisphere stroke. Even though after a left hemisphere stroke, there are problems for most people with language and using the dominant hand, but they're still in touch with reality. Whereas when you have a right hemisphere stroke, even though they can speak and use their right hand, uh, the subject may be entirely out of touch with reality and not even realize that there's anything much wrong with them getting in the way of their leading a normal life. And then probably this is the most important one between the present thing and the represented thing. So as something is fresh in its presence to you, the right hemisphere is better at taking it in. And once it becomes a kind of abstraction, a representation, a type, it then gets treated by the left hemisphere. And it is literally then no longer present, but re presented, but it's not the same as it was when it was first present. As we get older, more and more of life becomes automatically processed in this uh, stereotyped way as representations rather than the presencing of things. Well, the, these that was rather abstract. This is more vivid. These are from some experiments uh, done in Russia by Nikolai Nikolayenko, in which one hemisphere at a time was um, knocked out for about 20 minutes following ECT. And on the left, you see a tree in the uh, intact uh, condition. In the middle, you see the left hemisphere's tree, which is both um, showing left hemifield neglect and showing how curiously stylized and symbolic the tree has become. Whereas the right hemisphere's tree on the right is um, a full flowing living organic form. And the, here you see the same thing with um, a flower. In the left hemisphere only condition, it gets reduced to a geometric symbol, whereas uh, under the right hemisphere only condition, it still has the living uh, flowing form of a flower. And this is really just to show that the right hemisphere is much better at seeing perspective, seeing depth. In fact, it sees depth in space, depth in time and shows greater depth in emotion than the left hemisphere. This is from uh, Gazanaga and Ledoux and uh, shows what happens to um, our sense of depth after um, a callosotomy. So in the top uh, line there, you have the left hand and then the right hand, both of them perfectly able to draw a respectable cube in perspective. After the operation, it's only the left hand that can still do it because it is in touch with the right hemisphere. The right hand, which all its life has been drawing the cubes, can no longer do it because it's not getting input from the right hemisphere. And it draws what a child draws, which is what it knows, but not what it sees. Now, this suggests that the lived perceptual reality um, that we experience is more dependent on the right hemisphere than the left. And it is. I'm going to be very um, quick and dirty with this, but just run through 
um, some data on the comparative strengths of the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere in various modes of perception. Well, um, the right hemisphere is superior to the left in spatial discrimination, detection of stimuli, localizing stimuli, uh, understanding depth, estimating size, matching orientation, adapting to orientation, pattern recognition, and in figure ground discrimination, in recognizing an object from unusual angles or particularly from impoverished or partial incomplete information. It's um, superior in color perception, in brightness sensitivity, in color discrimination. And it's also superior in most forms of perception that are non-visual. So in oral perception, it's better at discriminating pitch, at localizing sounds, at dealing with um, smell and taste, and it has superior tactile discrimination. So what happens when the right hemisphere um, suddenly goes uh, on the blink? Say it has a, there's a massive stroke in the right hemisphere, or even a fairly local stroke, sometimes depending on exactly where it is. Well, the world becomes a very strange place. Basically this pandemonium, and I put up this picture from Hieronymus Bosch to suggest the halluc hallucinations and delusions that follow. I'm just going to run through this very quickly. I'm hoping that you don't, you'll be familiar with the terminology I'm going to use since you're all neurologists. Um, so I won't explain it, but if somebody wants these slides later, I'm sure there's a way I can let you have them. But let's look at some of the distortions in reality that occur after brain injury and see whether they are commoner after right or left hemisphere damage. Well, um, John Cutting uh, did the largest systematic study to date of the nature and lateralization of brain lesions giving rise to anomalous or altered perceptions. And he found that 73% of them were due to right hemisphere lesions. And it's more significant than that because what he found was that the ones due to right hemisphere lesions were much more gross um, they were much more subtle after um, left hemisphere lesions. And Brown and Safran in the same year did a comprehensive survey of literature, this time on uh, delusions and lateralization. And they found, interestingly, 73% due to right hemisphere lesions. So what are we talking about? We're talking about these are all very largely or almost exclusively follow right hemisphere deficits in the literature uh, in which we can localize a lesion in relation to the clinical phenomenon. Delusional paranoia, hemineglect, anosognosia, denial of a disease or a defect, asomatognosia, not recognizing parts of one's own body, anosodiaphoria, having a completely inappropriate affect in relation to um, a loss of function, um, somatoparaphrenia, which is where you actually believe that part of your body belongs to another individual. Prosopagnosia, inability to read faces. Delusional misidentification, such as Capgra and Fregoli phenomenon, in which you mistake someone familiar for someone unfamiliar or the other way around. Mirrored self-delusion, in which you don't recognize your own image in the mirror. And supernumerary phantom limbs. I'm not talking about the phantom limb phenomenon here that follows um, uh, trauma or surgery uh, resulting in the loss of a limb, I'm talking about people with intact bodies who see um, added phantom limbs. All of those were very largely or almost entirely uh, dependent on right hemisphere lesions. So are these, Kotar's delusion, the delusion that you are dead and in some cases are so deluded that you demand burial. Um, Alice in Wonderland syndrome in which time perception is altered and spatial perception is altered autoscopy, in which you stand outside your body and see it from a distance, um, misoplegia, taking against a part of your body and um, trying to harm it, xenomelia, which is uh, where people actually ask for amputation of a limb, a perfectly healthy limb. So all of those extraordinary uh, distortions of reality are much commoner after right hemisphere distortion, after right hemisphere damage. These are somewhat more common after right than left, 
uh, Othello syndrome, which is otherwise known as delusional jealousy, de Clerambault syndrome, erotomania, which you believe that some uh, distinguished celebrity figure or, or member of royalty or, or whatever is in love with you. Um, these are neither right nor left. Hey, autoscopy, which is rather like autoscopy, but is the uh, doppelganger um, uh, illusion. That's practically the only one there. And there is one, uh, there are more of these, sorry. Uh, th there's only one, as far as I know, that has um, a, a preponderance after a left hemisphere deficit. And it is very largely uh, to be found only after left hemisphere deficit, and that is autotopagnosia. Now, of course, I'm not dealing with problems like dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and so on, because I'm talking about reality distortions here, not about difficulties manipulating language or symbols. And that's kind of important, uh, as I will explain. Uh, I just want to take you through these very briefly. Orin Davinsky, uh, neurologist in New York, delusions result from right hemisphere lesions, but it is the left hemisphere that is deluded. Nikki Marinsek, a member of Mike Gazaniga's team, only patients with right hemisphere brain damage continue to overestimate their ability to perform a task after they just fail to perform the task. And you know, Pankset now sadly dead, but a great authority on um, neuropsychology, particularly of emotion. Uh, as you know, confabulation is common, but very much commoner after right hemisphere damage. He says the left hemisphere even chooses to confabulate when it doesn't actually need to because it has the information necessary. Now, here we come back to the slide I showed you near the beginning. And I said that this couldn't be, um, this, these expansions couldn't be due to um, the, the acquisition of language because they existed in apes that don't have language. Well, so what are these expansions to do with? Well, the posterior expansion seems to be to do with symbol manipulation. Apes are the first that are able to use symbols, visual symbols for things, and therefore to make certain Melton calculations using them, even if it's not strictly language. In other words, it's already starting the process that the left hemisphere has gone very far in human uh, consciousness of dealing with the aspects that are abstract and not in front of us and not actually currently being experienced. It's as though the brain needs to go offline and do some theoretical planning. And I think this is because in a nutshell, because of the huge expansion of the frontal lobes in humans, which enable us to distance ourselves from the world, to think of a strategy, to see a way forward that is more intelligent. And so we have, as it were, our own personal computer in the brain. I tend to dislike the image of the brain as a computer because I think it hides almost everything special about uh, the human brain. But uh, in this sense, in this sense only, the left hemisphere is a little like a computer in that the right hemisphere understands reality. And it therefore has data it wants processing. And the left hemisphere can carry out known procedures very quickly, like a computer not really understanding it, but doing the job. And then the data are brought back, as it were, from the left hemisphere into the realm of the right hemisphere, where they're resituated in the context of the whole lived world and get their meaning. And just before leading this slide, so what is this expansion in the frontal region in the right hemisphere? This is the social brain. This is what makes us the very special primates that we are. All primates are more social than most animals, and we are particularly the social animal. And this underwrites um, theory of mind, the ability to understand that another person knows or thinks something different from what you're thinking, to feel for others, to feel empathy, um, to, uh, as it were, read minds, to um, understand what has not been said, i.e. the implicit, to understand tone of voice, irony, humor, poetry, all those things that make us very human. Well, we now, it seems to me, live in a world in which the left hemisphere has taken over. The left hemisphere, the one that deals with symbols, uh, I don't mean literally, of course, as you perfectly well know, that we're not using our right hemispheres, we are. But in constructing a model of the world to try and understand it, we're using a very 
basic mechanical model, which is typical of the way the left hemisphere thinks. It's a machine, it has parts, this is how we understand it, by breaking it down and taking it apart and then building the world up again from little bits using a, 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 a symbolic uh, world. So that you get this kind of absurdity that we live in a world in which there are signs only that clearly refer to other signs, not to the world at large. And this was foreseen by this Russian author, Yuri Tinyanov, who in 1927 published a novel called Lieutenant Kizhe. It was obviously a satire on the Soviet system, but in order to be safe, he cast it in um, Imperial Russia. And it's a story of a lieutenant who never existed, whose name got onto a, a list in the Imperial Army because somebody mistranscribed the list and invented a subject called Lieutenant Kijé. And the point of the story is that the fact that Lieutenant, Lieutenant Kijé didn't exist didn't stop him from having a very remarkable career. He was found to be a very good colleague, to be very dependable. He showed bravery in engagements in battle. He was decorated for bravery. And finally, he was promoted to the rank of general. And when the Tsar asked to meet this paragon, he could not be found anywhere. Meanwhile, another man who'd been, whose name had been left off the list, Sunyukhaev, was wandering around Russia with a begging bowl, trying to explain to people that even though he wasn't on the list, he was still very much alive and needed food. So I think that's a, an amusing, ironic uh, example of the way we live. I don't know if it's as bad as this in India, but in, in Britain, um, it, it, the notes are everything. There has a saying, if it's not in the notes, it didn't happen. But equally, if it's in the notes, it did happen. It's no good saying, well, that's just not true, because the reality is what's written on this piece of paper. As long as you tick the checkbox, it doesn't really matter whether you actually did the operation, and especially not if the patient died. The thing was a success because it's recorded on our data sheet. So I'm going to round up now and finish off these are my last slides, but I just want to say, if I'm right, that the world is now taking the view of itself that is um, too much skewed towards the left hemisphere's picture and ignoring all the rich things that the right hemisphere would enable us to see, what would the world look like? Well, let's do a thought experiment. There'd be loss of the broader picture. We'd become focused on detail not by simply information, data, tokens, or representations, what's on the list. And wisdom would be right out because you can't get a, a machine to assess that. That's something that comes from long human experience. There'd be loss of the concepts of skill and judgment which are embodied and human, and they'd be replaced by algorithms that a computer could follow. The world would become simultaneously more abstract and more reified. In other words, matter would lose its status as something that is capable of being involved with consciousness and would just become lumpen material for our exploitation. And at the same time, we'd be living in a highly abstract realm of abstract um, bureaucratic verbiage. In fact, bureaucracy, according to Peter Berger, a very distinguished sociologist, would have a field day because these are the things that it really likes and they're all underwritten by the left hemisphere. It'd also be a loss of the sense of uniqueness. Uh, everyone would have to fit into a box or a category, and it would be which category or box that they fitted into that would be most important, not actually who they were and what their unique qualities were. Quantity, in fact, would become the only criteria, and if there's more, it's better. Decisions would be made on a black and white, either or basis, like those things where you have to score which of these boxes is most represents your view. Well, there's never a box for me because I want to say, well, it depends. It depends on the circumstances and for whom and on which day. And um, reasonableness, which is taking all the context into account, would become replaced by a dogmatic rationality, which is just the following out of logical procedures without using uh, your emotional and social intelligence. There would in fact be a general failure of that now uncommon thing, common sense. Systems would be designed merely to maximize utility. Social cohesion would begin to break down as everyone became atomistic and individualistic. The government would then get upset and would see things depersonalizing and it would become paranoid and start lacking trust. 
It would start monitoring its population, putting up CCTV cameras everywhere, trying to build up a database of the population uh, with uh, DNA samples and so forth. In other words, a need for total control. Because remember, the left hemisphere's reason for being, in a way, has, it's evolved to be the one that controls, that always enables us to be in control. But so much in life uh, is different from that. And if we are always trying to be in control and wish to control everything, we will make many uh, egregious errors. Anger and aggression would become part of the typical way in which people would relate in society. Um, and we would see ourselves as passive victims. You know, it's his fault, not mine. It's the government's fault, not mine. Um, because if you remember, the left hemisphere can never see that it has a problem. If it's half paralyzed, no, 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 that's somebody else's problem. And finally, art would become highly conceptual. Visual art would lack a sense of depth and there'd be distorted or bizarre perspectives. Music would get reduced a little more than rhythm, which is the part of music that the left hemisphere can understand. It can't understand melody and harmony, or at least not in most ordinary individuals. Language would become diffuse, excessive, and lacking in concrete reference like a lot of management um, bulletins, which of course I keep by my bedside in case I ever um, find I'm uh, having insomnia. I can't read more than half a page without uh, easily getting back into a peaceful sleep. There'd be a deliberate undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder because the left hemisphere doesn't understand awe. The right hemisphere does, but the left hemisphere just says, what do you mean? It's just about, I haven't got enough data yet. When I've got enough data, it'll be easy. Flow would be reduced to just an infinite series of pieces. We'd be discarding all the tacit forms of knowing and life would become uh, cloaked in what de Tocqueville called in the 1830s, a network of small complicated rules. We'd be more spectators than actors in our lives as Descartes proudly described himself, um, sitting on the sofa watching television. And all this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism. Whew, well, I'm glad we don't belong to that world anyway. Well, that was my talk. I won't mention Donald Trump, but I will um, try and get out of this now and um, get back to a picture where you can see me and I can see you. And we have half an hour, I hope, for questions. Okay. Sudeem, shall we yeah, go ahead, sir. ask? Go ahead with some of the questions that have been asked. Um, um, you can ask something by, and I'll put up the PowerPoint of all the questions that have been asked. Then we can just. Oh, you got them in front of you? Yeah, I'll put them up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, there's one point that you had made, uh, Sudhir, about the sort of, you know, left versus right hemisphere and big picture versus small picture. Uh, yeah, I think he, uh, Ian told us the right is the is, picture. The right, right. and left. Okay, I'm just going to uh, share some questions uh, that have been raised. Uh, it was an amazing uh, talk. Um, Dr. Meshram asked, Dr. Meshram is a uh, senior neurologist from Nagpur. He's asking, the brain of Albert Einstein apparently had very prominent and well-developed corpus callosum when he died and was like that of a 25-year-old. And his intelligence was correlated with the corpus callosum. So what do, what are your comments? Is the corpus callosum important for intelligence? Or uh, like you said, it seems to be from dog to man. So the less the corpus callosum, the better. Well... Yes, I mean, the short answer is that I don't think we can tell too much from just looking at an individual's brain. Um, for example, Einstein's brain is somewhat smaller um, than, than, than I think the average male brain. So uh, uh, what you make of that, I don't know. Um, it's to do with the way in which things are, uh, if you like, connected inside the brain. But it's a mistake to think that, the, that a bigger corpus callosum is better. Um, there are larger uh, corpus, uh, corpora callosa in um, schizophrenia and in autism. Um, there is an argument that uh, Einstein was autistic, of course, um, and um, as indeed a number of very distinguished um, scientists, mathematicians, and occasionally artists have been. 
Um, but you've got to remember that, first of all, one of the functions of the corpus callosum is inhibition. And it's getting a balance between facilitation and inhibition. It's very difficult to know in any one brain um, whether the fibers in that brain, uh, once you're left with a, a, a post-mortem specimen, uh, were largely to do with, uh, it's much too complex a matter to be able to decide from measuring the size of the corpus callosum. And indeed, um, the, it used to be said that the corpus callosum is bigger in females than males. And we now think that this is true in some section um, of the corpus callosum, um, but not in others. But it leaves open the question of whether this is good or bad, because in evolution, we need them to be working together. But we also need them to be working separately. And problems exist for people who are too extreme either way. So I think that's as far as I would like to go with that particular question. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the next. Uh, Apurva, you can uh, ask the next question. Yeah. Uh, it was a great talk. And my question is, if corpus callosum is joining only 2% of neurons on the two side, and that too inhibitory in nature, then how the sense of self a unified sense of self is created, how the sense of free will is created, and where? Right. Um, huge questions, of course. Um, first of all, the fact that only 2% of neurons actually themselves cross the corpus callosum doesn't mean that networks aren't talking to one another all the time across the corpus callosum. And inhibition is creative. So inhibition isn't just a matter of uh, something negating something. You may probably know that primates have more inhibitory neurons than any other animals, and that human brains have more inhibitory neurons than any other primate. Um, at least 25% of our neurons are functionally inhibitory. So clearly this has some very great importance for us. And it's that we're able to separate things in consciousness, but still joined in one consciousness. Now, the, the sense of our consciousness, I mean, you, you are, of course, asking in a way a question that leads us into philosophy. And I gave a two hour uh, talk uh, to a group in London uh, a month ago on consciousness and the brain, but it would take me a very long time, as you see, to go very far into it. But I think the short answer is that our sense of ourselves comes from everything that we experience seamlessly into the level below our consciousness. And that, of course, most of what is coming to us is not conscious. We think the bit of us that is us is the bit that's now talking. But um, a very large percentage, uh, one paper amusingly, um, says 99.44%. Well, <laughs> I don't know how you get to 99.44%, but you don't have to buy that degree of precision to be able to say, yes, very much the largest part of everything that is going on in communication in ourselves is not coming to our consciousness. It's, it's embodied and it's acted on and it's all part of what makes us us. It's not not us doing it because we are that field in which all these actions conscious and unconscious are going on and it, i mean it's also true that even people who have had um callosotomy um there are some interesting phenomena as you know immediately post callosotomy but usually they settle down quite quickly to a sense of oneself and um, partly because information is coming to the body all the times from all directions in space and from both sides of the body. And that much of it is synthesized below the level of the corpus callosum in the midbrain um, uh, uh, and so on. So I really do think that, uh, and in the brain stem. So I, I just think that um, uh, the answer is that um, it's not right to think of the two hemispheres as being ultimately entirely separated. And the answer to the question, do we have two brains or one, is, of course, well, neither. We have this wonderful thing, which times acts in synchrony and at in time capable of acting differentially. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll again share the screen. Um, Dr. Barucha, you can go to the next question. Uh, I'll... Sure. Dr. Keyur Buch, can you read them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 
are there any <coughs> differences uh, in the uh, functions of the two uh, hemispheres in left-handed people uh, is one question uh, yes the, yeah. the, 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 um, and um, I suppose one of the most left-handed and right-handed is there any difference between the two brains whether you are left-handed or right-handed well um, there are three kinds of left-handers there are those a very small group in which almost everything is uh, situs inversus. And so you have uh, where everything I've talked about in the left hemisphere would be their right hemisphere and vice versa, but that's unusual. Um, and then you get people, a relatively small group again, whose brains are almost, almost entirely, apart from handedness, uh, similar to as it were the standard right-handed model. But what interests me is the majority of cases in which um, there is, as it were, a different pattern of assortment. And so you get things that don't normally sit together in the brain doing so. And this yields both exceptional skills and exceptional um, deficits. And as you possibly know, left-handed people are overrepresented at the top end of almost every spectrum and at the bottom end. Um, so it's one of those interesting areas. Um, in terms of speech, 97% of people um, have a functional broker's area in the left frontal lobe, um, and 3% of right-handers still have it uh, in the right. But with left-handers, it's 60% in the left hemisphere and 40% in the right. So, of course, before neurosurgery, uh, it's usual to do the used to be anyway when I was <laughs> doing it, the word of test in which you isolate one hemisphere at a time to find out which one has speech, because it's not entirely, um, doesn't necessarily follow standard pattern. But it's a good question. Okay, the next one. Uh, Rushab Gavali. Sir, please go ahead. Dr. Barucha. Yeah, uh, the, the, he, he's asked about uh, autism uh, spectrum, uh, there's a question about autism spectrum disorder and uh, uh, how is it affected by uh, right hemisphere functions such as, uh, I'm afraid I don't know some of these terms, central coherence, pragmatics, mm. uh, gestalt we know and you mentioned that, uh, context processing, uh, yes. How, how, how would these sort of uh, play a role in autism spectrum disorder, defects in these? Well, you, you're absolutely right to draw attention to the fact that uh, very often in autism, there is a picture which um, resembles right hemisphere deficit syndrome. I think I would say that there are autisms, not just autism. For example, one of the best known subjects who is um, very um, articulate about her autism is Temple Grandin. And she thinks only in visuospatial images. She doesn't think in words. Whereas many people with autism think only in words and can't think using verbal, uh, sorry, visual images. So uh, clearly there are different kinds of autism. But you're absolutely right that all those things that you mentioned, context, uh, processing, gestalt, perception, um, central coherence, which is part of the same idea of being able to understand a whole picture uh, understanding um, non-literal meaning, reading body language and faces. All of this is uh, not uh, very good in most subjects with autism. And in terms of neurology of it, there are two, uh, well, there are three findings, I suppose, that are of interest. One of them is uh, to do with the vermis of the cerebellum, and I'm not really um, going to go into the cerebellum part because uh, I'm... <laughs> Um, you know, particularly interested in the cerebrum and not so knowledgeable about the cerebellum. But in the cerebrum, uh, there are abnormalities, as mentioned, in the corpus callosum and in the myelination of it. But the most significant finding probably is to do with uh, imperfect myelination in the right hemisphere long tracts. The, the, the long white tracts, the longitudinal fasciculi um, and... Um, the um, 
uh, I've said it earlier, <laughs> mine's called Blake, but the, the, the various, uh, the unsummate fasciculus, these fasciculi, which are so important in holding together the function of the right hemisphere, appear to be uh, slow transmission, uh, possibly due to, uh, well, almost certainly due to um, myelination problems in people with autism and also in people with schizophrenia. Okay. Um, Very good. Thank you. Next one, Dr. Sanjeev. Um, so go ahead. If the, if, yeah, they, I think here there are, I think here uh, Dr. Sanjeev has asked a couple of uh, questions. In fact, if it's the one, at the, I think the first point is that the right hemisphere is involved early on in life. Uh, the the uh, person seems to do, the individual seems to do fairly well as an adult. Uh, this can be either as a child or intrauterine. And a totally separate issue, which is, I think, also quite interesting, is uh, uh, what about the role of the right hemisphere in the Indian uh, fortune teller who can see the future or a very distant object at the same time? Uh, I mean, it's an amusing uh, question, but I, I think uh, there may be something, I don't know. So, Well, about the second question, um, I'm fascinated and I would look to you to help me with that because yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know where to study that illuminates this. And um, if you do, please be so kind as to um, send me um, a link to something. I would... Mm. I would love over that. To and, and yeah, over to anyone who does wish to contact me, you just Google. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah. it's easy to do that. Uh, but um, we do know that in um, many savants who have skills that we simply can't understand, uh, often calculation, of course, but also abilities to solve problems that are baffling to most um, uh, you know, people of uh, normal, normal neurotypical brain uh, organization. So I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that uh, such skills were associated with the right hemisphere, but I couldn't mm. give you any information on it at all at this mm. stage. Mm. Um, the other question was about adaptation in uterine and in early life. And mm. of course, you're absolutely right that and provided um, that the damage is at a relatively early stage, usually up to the age of um, perhaps nine or 10, um, the brain is much more plastic. And of course, we now know that the, the brain goes on being plastic in a way that when I was in training, we were taught it didn't, but we know that the brain can uh, exercise plasticity uh, into adulthood, but obviously not this kind of very gross um, uh, uh, ability to, to uh, as it were, remedy the lack of a, a hemisphere. What we do know is that um, in cases where this happens, it's quite true that the functions of the left hemisphere, if it's the left hemisphere has been removed, get taken over by the right. But it's less true that functions of the right hemisphere get taken over by the left in the case of a right hemispherectomy or right hemisphere damage. It seems that somehow the left hemisphere functions are prepotent and they're being together in the same hemisphere with the normal right hemisphere functions has a damaging or depressing effect on uh, intelligence. Uh, interestingly, uh, there is strong evidence from a study by Barbie et al. in 2014, in which they looked at intelligence in the adult brain in people who had had IQ tests done um, pre-lesionally uh, and then after sustaining a stroke to find out which areas of the brain were critical for intelligence. And it's worth looking up the paper. It is quite extraordinary virtually all the areas that are critical for intelligence are in the right hemisphere, not in the left. Um, anyway, um, coming back to that point, after hemispherectomy, uh, subjects do much better uh, if they've lost the left hemisphere than if they've lost um, the right hemisphere. 
uh, at least in most of the studies, there is one study which suggests that there is no difference, which, uh, which may well be the case. But yes, of course, we're talking here about um, the amazing ability of the brain to be plastic very early in development. And of course, there's a famous case reported by John Lauber of a man who had a first class degree in mathematics and an IQ of 126, uh, who was imaged and was found only to have a, a small cortical mantle of about a couple of centimeters depth. And most of his head was filled with um, cerebrospinal fluid. Extraordinary. Uh, as you pointed out, when we have a stroke, uh, our first uh, instinct is that when language is gone, then that must be the, the left hemisphere must be the more important one because you lose language. But actually, the ones who have right brain damage do worse. They don't have insight. They don't cooperate with uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation efforts, etc. So, so they may speak. They may be able to understand language, but they are less functioning. That's right. I mean, when you ask carers what the problem is looking after patients who have a right hemisphere uh, stroke, they say lack of empathy, inability to understand. Um, if you ask people what are the problems after a left hemisphere, they, straight, they say reading and writing. But in other words, it's manipulative skills that enable us to manipulate the world through our hand, through writing and speaking go, but the big, broad, deep understanding of the world is from the right hand. Can I, uh, I go to the next make, one? Make, yeah. uh, Can I make a point, uh, Sudhi? Just a, a query? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wondered about creativity. Uh, could creativity result from a conflict between the left and the right hemisphere? Well, Thank you for asking me. It is a very good question. Um, and it's one I have researched in some considerable depth for many years. Um, and I would love to be able to say that the popular myth that the right hemisphere is more powerfully creative than the left was wrong. But <laughs> unless there is truth in it. Um, and uh, you know, it would be much easier to go, oh, it's all rubbish. But I'm afraid I have to report that no, that actually is one other thing that people have always said that does turn out to be true. Um, there's some confusion about it because when you come to look at the research, it depends very much whether you're talking about truly creative thinking in people who are highly creative or whether you're just talking about something which is a kind of a task that can be done in a lab which substitutes for creativity. Now, if you, if you focus on that, then you find there is no right hemisphere advantage, there may be a left hemisphere. But if you talk about true high creativity, there is no question that the right hemisphere is very much superior. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, there's a, there are books, papers by um, a, a figure called Arne Dietrich uh, in Israel, who has, um, written a rather swashbuckling account of why this is all tosh. Um, and I'm afraid I've had to laboriously go through every one of the papers that he refers to and produce a rebuttal, which will form an appendix to the book that I'm now writing. Would you say that the left brain is the more efficient one and the right brain is the more original one uh, as far as creativity is concerned? Coming up with something original, the right brain is more likely at doing something efficiently or uh, you know faster and better way the left brain might well there are a number of reasons why you would expect on first principles that the right hemisphere would be better at it one is that it can bring to bear more widely uh, more diffuse neural networks the left hemisphere neuronal network structure is much more tightly local so um, when it's trying to search for something, it keeps looking in the same place. There's another the joke about the man who lost his wallet and he's looking under the light. And then somebody says, where did you lose the wallet? And they said, over there. Well, why are you looking under the light? Well, that's because where, that's where the light is. But the left hemisphere is a little bit like that. It's 
is that it, it's sort of stuck to what's known. And the right hemisphere is better at making broad steps in different areas. Mm. It's oh, also better yeah. at understanding the implicit. It's better at bringing together um, different aspects of intelligence at once. And it's not desperately trying to close things down to a certainty. The left hemisphere is always keen to make something clear cut. And in the creative mm. process, the one thing you don't want is to have to clear cut too early on. Okay, Apurva, you want to take these questions? Yeah, no, I, I think we are towards concluding part of the discussion. I have one uh, comment or a sort of question. We, you have said that language is present in both hemisphere, cognitive functions are present in both hemisphere. You said that both hemispheres are doing all functions, maybe a bit differently than the other. There is a query from a practicing clinician like me that in a person with a left hemisphere damage with aphasia, how much time and energy we should devote in assessment of cognitive functions other than language, cognitive functions which are known to be predominantly carried by right hemisphere and vice versa, how much time and energy on practical level should we devote in a right hemisphere person with normal speech uh, in assessment of linguistic functions. We know that they may be affected to some degree. So how to find a practical balance? Quite right. And I suppose, you know, as a clinician myself, I, I know that um, yeah, there are also questions about the amount of time and, and effort that one can put in. But I do think very much that it is worth asking a lot of the questions that don't get asked. One of the reasons I was able to write the book that I did was that it was a turning point in my life. I heard a lecture by a colleague, Dr. John Cutting, who worked also at the University of Manhattan Hospital and uh, was at the Institute of Psychiatry. And he had spent 20 years sitting at the bedside of people with right hemisphere stroke and finding out what was wrong with their, with their, with their world. And he published a book in 1990 called The Right Cerebral Hemisphere and Psychiatric Disorders. Um, and it, he was really the first person to bring all this material together, I think. Some of it was done by some neuropsychologists in France, Ekel and uh, Julie Hedren, who, um, who looked a lot at right hemisphere damage patients. But John Cutting you know, actually sat with patients and found out all that stuff that when they're on a busy ward is not asked. Usually if they had a left hemisphere stroke, then people say, okay, we get speech therapy, we get physiotherapy for the arm and so on. But if they had a right hemisphere stroke, they just go, oh well, people can send them home. Yeah, sorry, you wanted to ask a question, I think. I'm going to just go into some questions fast before we close. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev asked how to improve right and left uh, hemisphere talk in this day's world, can you improve? Uh, there have been some books on how to uh, do you want to and if you can want to do you? Well, is this Dr. Shetty's uh, remark? Shetty's question is also important, is also interesting. He's saying, uh, why do we need the left hemisphere at all? How do we make it subservient to the right? This is already well, thank you very much. Um, the, the, we do need it very much, but as I say, we need it to work, as it were, in harmony and indeed subservient to the right hemisphere. Because the right hemisphere sees the whole. One image I have is if you're learning a musical instrument, to begin with, you love this piece of music, you try to play it. And that's the right hemisphere's approach. And then you realize you need to break it up into little bits and practice the fingering and you start taking the part structure. That's the left hemisphere. But then when you come to play it, you need to forget it again. Uh, what all that stuff. It doesn't mean it was bad doing it. It was very important doing all that analysis. But when you come to play, you must forget it. So that is the image. The left hemisphere is a good servant. It's a very poor master. It's as though one allowed a computer to run one's clinical work. Sadly, it's one of the things management is increasingly trying to make happen in the clinical world. But the answer is it's very valuable. And the image of the master and his emissary in the title refers to that because the master is the right hemisphere. His emissary 
is a functionary who goes away and does work so that the master can get on with the important thing. But the emissary is not, doesn't know what it is, doesn't know. It doesn't know its own limitations. And so it tries to become the master. And that's when the problem starts. And that, I believe, is our current problem. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask, would you say that the left brain is a splitter and the right brain is a dumper? I, I, the uh, connection talk, wasn't very good there. Uh, we talk about splitters and lumpers. Somebody who splits. Can you hear uh, splitters and lumpers? Oh, splitters and lumpers. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I see that not as a right versus left thing, but I see that both being a splitter and being a lumper are left hemisphere modes. Being fully in touch with your right hemisphere, you won't want to carve everything up and put it all in little boxes. But also you won't lump everything together in gross categories. You're able to see the unique case, the unique quality. Uh, and so I say, you know, in Shakespeare, it says neither a, a borrower or a lender be. I say neither a splitter nor a lumper be. <laughs> and uh, the last question, um, in some ways, do you think the left brain is more autocratic and right-wing politically than the left uh, right brain? A little more liberal. No, interesting. no, not really, because what I think is that there are very left hemisphere orientated types of figures on the left and on the right. And there are very right hemisphere orientated people on the left and on the right. Okay. And no, I don't think it works. Okay, my last question before we go, it was a wonderful talk. Do you have a bias towards the right hemisphere? Do I? Do you have, do I a, have a bias? Do you have a bias yes. to the right hemisphere? Yes, I do. And, and, and people often pick me up on it. Um, <laughs> um, and I say, look, I've got nothing against the left hemisphere. After all, it's my second favorite hemisphere. You know, I mean, come on. But to be serious, to be serious for a moment, and I feel that everybody talks about and knows the power of the left hemisphere. There's no danger in our culture of that being forgotten. But there is a danger in our culture of neglecting all the richness of life, which actually comes out of what the right hemisphere sees. And so I need to correct the balance. And in doing so, I seem sometimes to push hard. Sometimes you have to push hard. Okay, uh, Dr. Ratnavali has, uh, she's uh, a cognitive girl. I should ask you specifically to ask the question. Do you think individuals and society are moving to a left way of doing and thinking? If so, what is the reason? What is the reason? Is society moving more towards left sided thinking? Yes, I, I think there are a number of reasons. In fact, um, this is not just to sell my book, but if you buy the new, the new edition of the paperback, I have an introduction in which I answer a lot of these questions. It's only 15 pages introduction, but uh, I do it better than I can do now. But I think the uh, one reason is that we became very fond of power, greed. If you look in the second half of the book, I look at the demise of Greek civilization, and the demise of Roman civilization and compare it with what I believe to be the demise of our civilization now. And in each case, what happened was a country overstretched itself. It had a huge bureaucracy. It had a huge army. It had dominions. And in that kind of a way, a left hemisphere orientated picture got into the world. And it was made worse for us by the Industrial Revolution, which has enabled us to roll out the left hemisphere's way of being in the world everywhere we see, everywhere we look, um, so that the right hemisphere doesn't any longer see, as I can see from my window here, the beauty of nature, the majesty of mountains and sea and so on. For most people, they're not seeing that. They're seeing a screen, a selfie, a cell phone, a street with, you know, it, 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 that's, those are a couple of the reasons. <laughs> and it's much easier for people to understand. You know, to try and explain the left hemisphere to people is, it's easy. It's, it's money for old rope, you know. But to try to explain to people why we value the right hemisphere, that's much more difficult. 
uh, and it, you know, language is set up to make it easy to explain the left hemisphere's point of view. Speech is going on in the left hemisphere. It's not good at knowing how to speak about what's going on in the right hemisphere. I had a go in that book, and I've had another go in the new book. So there we are. Okay. Thank you, Ian. That was a brilliant and marvelous talk. Uh, Dr. Barucha will just uh, say yeah. what I know. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, been a wonderful talk. And thank you, Sudhir. I don't know how you had the, uh, you know, this sort of, I think, using your right hemisphere a lot, I think, these TED <laughs> lectures, web, no, I mean, webinars, I, I think so. I heard anyway. his talk. I heard his yeah. uh, talk on the uh, this thing too and his book and I said we must uh, get him. Yeah, it's really wonderful. It's a real and privilege. It was great that I wrote to him and next day he wrote back uh, saying yes. It I is phenomenal. phenomenal. Thank you very, very much. It's Thank been you, a huge yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good night. Good day. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks to the audience as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Thank you.